Right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the good news is that we're all living longer these days, but the bad news is that um, we're more susceptible to these age-related neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's disease that we've already heard about this morning. Now, the problem is that for many of these neurodegenerative disorders, we haven't really got any effective treatments. Um, for Parkinson's disease, we're fairly lucky uh, in that we have some treatments available, but these are mainly symptomatic. Uh, and they only treat um, the motor symptoms of the disease, and they don't treat the other secondary features of the disease, particularly cognitive decline, which is one of the biggest determinants uh, about the long-term health care of people with Parkinson's disease. And also, once we've developed neuroprotective strategies, and the ones that have been trialled so far in clinical trials have been quite disappointing. And the problem is that we're probably putting uh, these uh, neuroprotective strategies into the brain when it's very advanced in damage. So what we need to do is develop uh, new diagnostics to try and pick up uh, people with Parkinson's disease very early and then put them onto therapies, which will actually prevent the further damage. Because, um, as you saw on the other slides uh, from the previous speaker, that by the time you see the, the motor symptoms uh, within Parkinson's disease, you've already lost about 70% uh, of the dopamine producing cells within the substantia nigra. Now, the whole fly in the ointment, really, is the blood-brain barrier and getting uh, therapies across the blood-brain barrier. Now, what makes the blood-brain barrier uh, so unique is that it has these uh, ultra-tight junctions here. So it's not very uh, porous uh, to many um, chemicals that are trying to cross the blood-brain barrier. However, there are a number of uh, transport mechanisms um, that ultimately we're going to try and target. And the idea is that if we use nanoparticles, either carbon nanoparticles or gold nanoparticles, um, we can actually use these to facilitate uh, the transfer of drugs across the blood-brain barrier for therapies. Alternatively, we, we could use these to get across the blood-brain barrier and improve the diagnos diagnostics. So this um, research fits uh, in with our uh, design. Um, in 2002, uh, Richard and myself set up the, the Parkinson's Tissue Bank at Imperial College. And this is a, a vital starting uh, point for us, um, because if we look at the human tissue, we can find out what's actually going wrong in the disease itself, and we can develop new drug targets, test them in our culture and animal model systems, and translate these into clinical trials. So these are some of the areas that we work on, but the nanoparticles and del drug delivery are quite key to this, because there are many molecules we'd like to get into the brain that we currently can't deliver. So the approach uh, that we're trying at the moment, the, the carbon nano, uh, tubes are much more advanced than our gold ones at the moment. Um, so what we're trying at the moment is different lengths, um, different functionalization of the carbon nanoparticles, and then what we'll attach to them is site uh, directive molecules that will facilitate their transfer across the blood-brain barrier. And another problem is that when we get drugs into the brain, we just hope that they're going to find the target. And obviously, then that is going to lead to many off-target effects uh, in drug delivery. So the holy grail, really, to this, this thing is to, is to have a particle in which we can put an arm on it, which will facilitate its transfer across the blood-brain barrier, and then another arm onto the molecule, which will direct it to, say, a specific uh, dopaminergic uh, neuronal population. So this work is done uh, with Alex Porter's group, who's an expert uh, in nanoparticles and is in the Department of Materials. Um, so Alex's group uh, pairs all the nanoparticles, and we've got two postdocs, uh, Michael and Angela. Uh, Michael does all the cellular work, and Angela does all the imaging. So this is a, an ERC, six-year uh, funded project. Um, so we're getting the, gradually all the particles uh, produced and then they're fed into this system. Um, so often what we use is a transwell system where you can actually grow the endothelial cells on one side of the barrier and the astrocytes on the other side so you can incubate 
uh, your nanoparticles on the surface here and see how they actually transfer through the barrier. Now we do this in a number of ways. Um, that we've got experts in uh, the EM looking at the actual uh, cells themselves and finding out where the particles are. Um, and also we can look at the, the various transport mechanisms which are responsible for getting the nanoparticles across uh, the barrier. And also, obviously, uh, with a, a secondary eye looking at toxicity. Are these uh, nanoparticles toxic uh, to the, to the blood-brain barrier itself? Now, the barrier models that we have, we've got um, three models. We have an immortalized uh, D3 cell, which is an endothelial cell. And this is really our workhorse uh, cell line here. Uh, because it's immortalized, you can um, easily grow up the cells. And then we check our results using a, a primary porcine uh, blood-brain barrier molecule. These cells are a lot more difficult to prepare and a lot more difficult uh, to actually culture. Also, we've got an ECV cell line, which is more of a, a generalized uh, epithelial barrier to see how it compares to transfer across uh, other barrier systems. Let's say we're quite advanced in quite a lot of the carbon nanoparticles, and we're just starting to now to go into manufacture uh, for our gold ones. So you probably can't, can't see too much on the resolution of this, but you can see, you can track um, the actual uh, carbon nanoparticles um, going from the actual uh, apical surface, and this is actually the filter uh, on this side, and so you can track the movement of the nanoparticles um, through the cell, and certainly uh, they're actually getting into the cell. So the first ones that we're trying at the moment are the different sizes of carbon nanoparticles and also their different functionalization. So these 4BP ones have got a positive charge. Um, we're looking at uh, different lengths. And certainly, if you change the length, um, you get changes in the way that they actually enter the cells. So also, it's what happens uh, when these particles get across the other side of the brain. Um, so the big concern is, um, does it actually interfere with the innate immune system uh, within the brain? Uh, does it trigger an inflammatory response? Uh, because one of the biggest problems that's been faced uh, with the gene therapy studies is that the, vector vi the viral vectors that have been used uh, to mediate the gene therapy have been triggering uh, an innate uh, response within the CNS. And certainly uh, in neurodegenerative disorders, you've got an inflammatory response already, so you don't really want to aggravate that. So we're looking at the response of the cells um, when the particles actually get across the other side of the barrier as well. So for this uh, part of the study, we've got, again, an immortalized microglial cell line, but we also uh, compare it to uh, primary microglia. So these are cultured uh, with the nanoparticles. Again, we do uh, EM work to looking at where they are in the cells. And then we can look at proliferation, assays, and see whether they're actually causing the activation um, of uh, the microglia. So this is just a, a time-lapse video. Um, you can see here you've got some uh, hungry microglia, and so this is an aggregate of um, carbon nanoparticles. And as you can see, that as you work through the video, uh, you'll see that the aggregate starts to get pulled apart um, by the microglia. Now, these forces to pull apart uh, the, the, the carbon nanoparticles, it, you know, is, 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 is great. So these are the muscle men. Uh, with inside the brain being able to pull these apart. And so then they'll ingest them, um, and then later on we can actually track uh, the trafficking and the metabolism of the particles once, once they get inside the cells. So then we can use a, a variety of techniques, so you look at the, uh, the live cell imaging, so you can spot the trafficking and breakdown uh, of the particles we also have very uh, sophisticated different imaging, uh, so you can actually mill through a sample and see about the interaction of uh, the particles with actually inside the cells. Also, what Angela is doing at the moment is actually 
um, looking about the fate uh, of the cell of the particles once they are inside the cells, and she takes a whole battery of images and then starts to map it through. So this is a two-hour pulse exposure to the carbon nanoparticles, uh, and then they're washed off. Uh, but then we track them uh, with time and see where they go with inside cells. Um, so what she's doing at the moment is actually doing the detailed analysis about which cellular components they go into, uh, how long they last within the cellular components, and really what happens to them in those uh, cellular components. So this work is still in its infancy, um, but certainly you can see here this is a cytoplasm uh, content, and this is looking at individual particles or actually aggregates. Uh, the ones that go in uh, and locate within the cytoplasm, with the 24 hours that we're looking at in this uh, short pulse at this present time, the particles you know, still seem to remain there. But the ones that go into the, the vesicles, um, within 24 hours, they're starting to be metabolized. And certainly from the EM work, you can see that the structure of the carbon nanoparticles is actually starting to be delaminated and eventually um, that the particles get broken down. So at the moment we're setting up artificial um, systems to look at the vesicular, a mimic a vesicular environment to see what uh, mechanisms are causing uh, the breakdown of the carbon nanoparticles. Also to, it's important to assess uh, what uh, any potential damage uh, to the cells, and here we've got a variety of assays. And as you can see here, thankfully, uh, that as you increase the, the concentration uh, of the different types of carbon nanoparticles, they don't seem to have any toxicity uh, within the microglial cells at all. Uh, also importantly, looking about the activation to see whether they cause any activation, we've got a variety of assays that we can look at. And here, if you take the microglia, uh, these are just the normal ones. And if you incubate them uh, with LPS, which is known activator of microglia, you can see large increases in production of things like the cytokines, like IL-6 and TNF-alpha. Um, but if you incubate them uh, with the different nanoparticles, whether they're pristine or whether they're acid oxidized ones, um, you don't see any uh, increase in production of the cytokines indicating that these are not causing the activation of the microglia. Um, when we first looked at the nitric oxide production, initially we were seeing some slight increases in nitric oxide production, particularly with the acid oxidized um, nanoparticles. And this is really because um, in the grease assay, um, the actual uh, carbon nanoparticles were actually interfering with the detection. So it's important if you're ever going to do any assays like that is to filter um, the carbon nanoparticles out of the medium before you start to do any assays. And you can see then it drops down to what you would get uh, just in the control uh, situations. So the good news is that um, you know, we can start to get some of these particles across the blood-brain barrier. And once they get across the blood-brain barrier, they're not causing any activation uh, of the immune system. So what we're going on now is to try and um, develop uh, site-specific uh, nanoparticles so that hopefully one day we can actually uh, direct drugs to particular neuronal populations or we can use them in imaging situations where we can pick up the diagnosis of patients. You know, even think about imaging uh, alpha-synuclein, which is the common abnormal protein uh, that is deposited in the Parkinson's brain. Thank you very much.